when Billy and us, when we found out he was going on vacation and he asked about uh, preaching, I, I preached before at other churches and uh, kind of got excited about it, but then I got to thinking, what do we need to, what do I need to speak on? And one thing, since we've been here at this church that has just really shown through and we're continuing to grow in is unity and purpose and the providence of God. So it's kind of where we're going to go more expounding on that. And if I had to put a title kind of on today's sermon, it would be Purpose for a Greater Fulfillment. Purpose for a Greater Fulfillment. Uh, before we get into the scriptures, though, I'm going to tell you a fictional story. But hopefully, that will tie right in with the sermon. So have you heard the news that Cedar Key Baptist Church is starting up a football team? I mean, think about it. We got a football team. We are going to play all the other churches around. And, but there's some key things to it. With this football team, we have brought in some, well, back in my day, we used to say ringers, but just really good Good players. I mean, all the way from California, we've brought in a defensive left tackle, Eddie. I mean, if you've seen this, this guy is big. You give him a mission, he's going to plow through. You, you face him, you know, you point him towards that quarterback. He knows what he's going to do. He's going to create holes. He's going to do all of it. But we also, we brought in all the way from South Carolina, a quarterback. You know who that is? Philip. Okay. And this guy has got an arm. He can throw all day long. He's precise. I mean, it, this, we're setting ourselves up good. Really good. And then we also got another one all the way from Texas. And this is for special teams. We brought this putter in. I mean, a punter in. He could kick the ball. I mean, I don't care where he's at. He's putting the ball between the goal posts. I mean, he's good. So we got it covered. But for the overall health of the team, you know, I've also brought in, we kind of recruited this young man, uh, Caleb. Some of you guys know him. And he's, he's our water boy, so to speak. <laughs> and, you know, but he, he's got this heart, really, for taking care of the team. So he's going to make sure they stay hydrated and meet the needs, Okay. But there was a problem with all this. We come up to the first game, and we're getting ready to, you know, kick off to start. And my quarterback that we brought in for a specific reason decided he didn't want to be a quarterback anymore. He was tired. Practice was rough. So he was just going to sit on the bench and watch the game. Well, you can imagine how this went. You know, we needed a quarterback out there. So, Caleb being what he is, he said, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll fill the position. I don't know much about it, but I'm going to jump in and do it. So, Caleb runs out there. Well, the game didn't quite go exactly how we planned. I mean, yeah, he did the best he could, you know, but okay. But we'll, we'll shake that off. And we went to the next game. Well, the next game, you know, the quarterback, he, he, Philip said, you know, I'm going to try to throw. You know, I know I kind of didn't do what I was supposed to, but I'm going to participate, but my heart's really not in it. But then our, def our defensive tackle, Eddie, comes up and says, you know what? I've been thinking. I really want to be a punter. I think I can do it. You know, but we tell him, you know, you're really not gifted that way or you're not built for being a, no, he's, I can do it. I'm athletic, I'm strong, I'm going to do it. You know, so he just kind of gets in there, and then our punter that we brought in, he's like, well, there's two of us, so what are we going to do? So they kind of work it out, trying to, amongst themselves, trying to figure out who's going to kick which 
field goal, who's going to do what, you know, and all these things. And it went through, but as you can figure, I mean, yeah, he could hit the, kick the ball with a lot of power, Eddie, when he gave it up there. But he didn't have much direction control with it. So this ball would just, you know, wide right, wide left. It was like he's playing for the Seminoles or something. And then <laughs> it was unbelievable, you know, his desire to fill that position. Well, it, he got depressed because we lost another game. And then the next game that comes up, we had the quarterback, the punter, and the tackle all say, you know what, this ain't working out like what we planned. So we're just going to sit out and not do nothing. Well, all of a sudden, here comes Caleb. I'm going to try to fill all, all the positions. I'm going to jump in. I'm going to do it. And he wore himself out completely to where we didn't achieve the goal that we had planned. But you still had a person that was just serving, serving, doing the best he could. And I tell this little story, and it'll make more sense when we read, get into the text that we're getting ready to read. It's going to be 1 Corinthians. If you open up 1 Corinthians chapter 12, starting in verse 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, starting in verse 12. <clears throat> For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body... Though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body. Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body. That would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God has arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor. And our, pres and our presentable parts are treated with greater modesty. Which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, given greater honor to the part that lacks it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles Second, prophets. Third, teachers. Then miracles. Then gifts of healing, helping, administrating, and various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? but earnestly desire the higher gifts, 
and I will show you a still more excellent way. <clears throat> when I was studying this, the first thing that jumps out to me when I start in verse 12, verse 12 through 13, for just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body. Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink one spirit. So what this is bringing out, when we were saved, when we become Christians, it wasn't a different kind of Savior that required different things for our salvation. It was one. So, this does away with our excuse of I prefer this, I prefer that. If it's one God, one body, one spirit that saves us, we are not here mainly for our benefit. We are here for what? What's that? To glorify God, to worship God. To build up one body. Another analogy that most of us have probably heard with this, because it's talking about the body. As we get older, I know many of you know I had severe back issues. And my back went out often, but when that happened, it shut me down completely. Uh, and because of the pain and what it did, it caused me to rely on different parts of my body to compensate for it. Just like with the little story we were talking about, little Caleb jumping in and filling these positions. Now, when this was happen, happening, my body and the parts in my body were designed for what purpose? To support this body. My, my members of my body support this body. It causes it to function correctly. It causes it to function in the purpose with which it was created. Now, when one of these things stops working or, or gets wore out, it affects not just that little aspect. So it was my lower back, the, uh, the vertebrae that was affected, actually ended up causing hip issues, knee issues, you know, neck issues because of this comp comp compensation that my body was naturally doing. What we're seeing here, when the start of this, if we don't understand this thing of the one body of Christ. Now, in this church, it, this is bringing out the important, importance and why we focus here at this congregation, this church, of membership. And why it's so important here. Because as we see a little bit further down in 18, but, but as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as he chose. So what's that mean? As he chose. Does that mean that you had a say in it? If he chose the members of this congregation, does that also mean that he has a purpose for you here? Just like my body, like my foot, my hands, all these things have a purpose here. So if you're here and God chose for you to be here, and we are one body, that means my job being here, God brought us here uh, from Mariana, Florida. He used a hurricane to make it all happen, to get us here. But he put me and Chrissy here in this body for a specific purpose. 
Now, I think this purpose, as we mature, it changes, morphs, and grows. As I mature, as she matures, as the church matures, our roles may grow and change a little bit. But do you view yourself with a specific purpose in this church? Or are you on the other side? God's put you here, yet I'm just comfortable sitting in this pew, not working with a purpose. I've got more of this attitude of, I've been taught I come to church to receive rather than a purpose to do. Now, there's benefits, and we understand as we get into these scriptures more and more of the unity. That's what this gets to talking about more and more is the unity of the body and how we're supposed to be striving for this unity. But as we mature in this unity, things are going to come out. Uh, the body is used to confirm what our giftings are so that we can better serve the body. Uh, would you say, who here is pretty confident they know what their gifting is? You're pretty confident you know what your gifting is. Now, is, have you ever taken the time to get confirmation from your brothers and sisters who are around you in Christ. Because sometimes you'll find that that varies greatly. What you think you're really good at is not affirmed by anybody else. Who here's watched American Idol or one of these shows with the singing? And they, you know, when going through the, the uh, audition stages, you know, they get up there and they think they can sing because their mom and daddy has told them they can sing so good. But whoo, they were not gifted in that light at all. But you're not going to tell them that because they have a dream. And so the key to this was us working together and building up this one body, one spirit, is understanding that it is one body with one purpose. And this purpose is not what Furlan wants. It's not what Roy wants. It's not what George wants. It's what Christ demands. That is the purpose that we have to align and un come to understand before we can get into all the rest of this. So after we see this, it, uh, that it's one body, one spirit, uh, and all this, it gets into, if the foot should say, this is in 14 or 15, if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body. How many of you feel, this goes through this with different body parts, is telling, you know, I don't feel like I belong. Have we ever felt that way, that we don't belong? At, even here at this church or any other church that I just don't feel like I'm where I'm supposed to be. Why do you think that is? If we, if we really believe what we read down here in 18, as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as he chose. So, if you are here and you are a member of this church, or you're visiting and, or you're maybe a member of another church, and you're just on vacation, think about it. God has put you there. Do you feel like you belong? And if not, is it because of maybe something you're not doing? Or is it maybe you weren't called to that church? So how do we figure this out? Well, first thing you do is you go back to where it says God puts you here. So if God puts you at a church, then you have a purpose in that church. I'm going to keep going back and back to this. Your purpose in the church is to what? We said part of it, glorify God. Main thing, main theme, bring worship, bring glory to God. 
But as we're going to see with the giftings that God gives, we're also with the purpose of building up the body. So just like all these parts that God has created in this body serve a purpose of supporting another part. So when one of them isn't working right, it affects a bunch of them. Same concept for church membership and being part of a body of believers is it's no matter how small, because it goes through and it covers all these things, you know, with the unpresentable and the presentable and the different places of honor, but they're all just as important because it helps us achieve something greater as a body. We have to let this sink in and marinate in our minds. You are here with the purpose of worshiping God, glorifying God, and building up the body. Now that looks different for each part. Your role may be just that, a support role. Your role may be more of the presentable side. But uh, another thing with this unpresentable parts, it made me think when we was, I was a manager at Blackwater River State Park while we was up there. And I got woke up in the middle of the night in horrendous pain. I mean, it was bad. And so we had to go to the hospital. Chrissy gets me to the hospital. I get there. They take some blood, run some tests. The next thing I know, here comes a crew of a bunch of people. And they're rushing me into emergency surgery. Apparently, I've got hours before I'm gone. Uh, gallbladder had quit, I guess, and stopped up my liver, my pancreas. It shut everything down. Because one thing stopped working. And it's something I can't see. They tell me it's in there. They say it does this function. And I have to believe them. Because I can't see it. But I do know when it wasn't working. I knew all about it at that time. Because it let me know what all it affects. Same thing. With, our, with the body. When one part is not functioning. We're not achieving all that the body was supposed to achieve and, or, or as well as it could achieve it. What's some examples of that? That here on Cedar Key, on the island here, we're very unique and blessed most of the time. But there's also some negative sides to it because when everything is going good here, everybody can rejoice. But when the things aren't going, everybody knows it too. When it's not going good, because it's that small community, everybody knows everything. So, if something happens at First Baptist, Cedar Key, say, bad, like some experiences that's happened here, everybody on the island finds out about it. So... Is that glorifying God to the non-saved world? What kind of what are we representing to them when we don't have the unity, when we don't have all the parts working right? Versus when we have good times, when everything is meshing well, unity is growing, we're fighting for it, and the rest of the island sees it, all of a sudden we start becoming this whole theme of an anchor or a lighthouse. They start calling when they need stuff because it's working correctly and it's dependable. Because the parts that are here are working. Now, can we work better? We can always work better. Now, to clarify, we're not talking about works for salvation. Salvation is taken care of. Through Christ, through Christ alone. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 tells us it's by grace, through faith, not of ourselves, a gift of God, not of works, so that none of us can boast. Always remember that. What we're seeing here is a byproduct of us being obedient 
to Christ. This is what he tells us for the church to work properly. We have to have a mindset of one body because it's one spirit that saved us. It's one Christ that saved us. It is all to focus and give him glory. And that's what the building up and the working of this body is for. Let's jump over to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4 real quick. Starting in verse 10. He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the statute, of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children, tossed to and fro by the waves, and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness, and deceitful schemes, rather speaking the truth in love. We are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped. When each part is working properly, properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. <clears throat> That's very important. How did this end in verse 31? 1 Corinthians 12, 31. But earnestly... Desire the higher gifts, and I will show you a still more excellent way. This excellent way he's talking about is love. And we're going to just read the first part of chapter 13 real quick. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I if I have, let's see, if I have prophecy, prophetic pro powers, and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and, have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. So, with these giftings and this purpose that we have in the church as members, each one of us here has been put here by God for a specific reason. For the body, for this church to function properly. Are you believing this and are are you stepping into this? Because what this is talking about is an action. You can't just sit there and wait for it to happen. Because if you're sitting there waiting, guess what's going to happen? You're going to be sitting there waiting. And waiting. And waiting. If we notice all through scripture, when we read, we're called into action. The Jewish people were constantly called in to obedience. Just that in itself. If you keep my commands, what? It shows that you love me. That's what God, Christ says. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. So in keeping, it's an action. It's not for a salvation, but it's showing the world and it's showing all this working properly that I love God he is my Lord he is my king and we have to have that understanding to be able to mature so when the elders here when Pastor Billy's teaching and preaching here 
He's equipping for this maturity. And when we're always talking about unity and building each other, each other up in love, it's so that when things come against us, when there's other false doctrines, we have the strength and the ability then to weather through it because the foundation is firm. The unity of the church. When you build something with blocks and you layer them over and you're, and you're splitting, you got two blocks together and you put one and split the middle and so on, it builds this solid thing that is hard to break and destroy. But if you just take a block here and a block over here and you stack one on top of here, one over here, and up, oh, we got to get all this done. So you try to, to, to weave them enough over, you know, guess what happens when the first storm comes? It falls, it breaks. It's not doing what it was called to do because the parts ain't working like it was supposed to.